Hello, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, so one of the most uh, interesting regions in which star formation currently takes place uh, is the Orion Mercury Cloud Complex. And uh, because it contains a perfect mix of proximity, uh, size, a range of stellar ages, stellar masses, and stellar densities, uh, Orion Nebula, uh, where's right over here is the probably the most famous part of it, but it's just a small part of a much larger structure that spans over 100 parsecs in the plane of the sky alone, and it contains several distinct stellar populations with uh, some are very young that are still associated with molecular gas, and some are much older with an ages of uh, up to 10 million years. Uh, however, despite its prominence, its uh, our understanding of star formation, uh, much of the structure of Orion remained to be unknown. Located at a distance of approximately 400 parsecs towards the galactic anticenter, Orion uh, was just a bit too far away for Hipparchus to get any number of precise enough measurements to get parallaxes and proper motions. Uh, Berta Lark has been on the site of radial velocity surveys uh, in the last decade or so. There have been uh, several thousands of stars for which we were able to obtain RVs with various studies, but most of the efforts have been focused just on the Orion A molecular cloud with relatively sparse coverage of all the other regions. Uh, this year, though, there have been two changes on both of these fronts. So the first change is, of course, the release of Gaia DR2. I don't need to tell you uh, anything about it. Just wanted to mention that Orion, like it's right over here, uh, in terms of physical units, the precision in distance that we could uh, get with Gaia DR2 is better than uh, 10 parsecs, and precision in proper motions is, uh, can be achieved to better than 0.3 kilometers per second. Uh, and the th second thing that happens this year is the Apogee Young Cluster Survey. Uh, so what Apogee is, is a multi-object uh, high-resolution spectrograph, which is mounted at uh, SDSS 2.5 meter telescopes. Uh, and it is uh, capable of observing up to 300 sources simultaneously over three degree field of view. Uh, and it is operating at H-band, so it's very good at peering through dust to observe very young stars. Um, and with Apogee, we were able to uh, um, obtain spectra of uh, various young stars in several nearby star forming regions, including in Orion. In total, we observed approximately 9,000 stars, usually several times for a total of 23,000 unique source visits positioned in these fields that you see over here. And the sources were selected based on their infrared axis, optical variability, and when feasible, previous identification as a young star based on other surveys. Um, in an attempt to create as uniform as possible of catalog uh, of uh, targets. Uh, and these data are highly complementary to Guy because they provide not only uh, the missing component of motion, which is radio velocity with very high degree of precision, better than a 0.5 km per second usually. Uh, and uh, also we can get uh, effective temperature, surface gravities, rotational velocities, metallicities, and much more. Um, so let's put all of these data together. Let's uh, combine Gaia and Apogee. So we've downloaded all the um, Gaia data towards Orion. Uh, oh, one moment. Uh, providing a few sensible uh, cuts in parallaxes and proper motions and radial velocities when feasible. We've also added a few cuts in the color magnitude space to get rid of the obvious main sequence stars and red giants. Uh, remaining with samples that is primarily consist of young stars in Orion, and here where they are positioned in the photometric and in spectroscopic space. And uh, just looking at the distribution of uh, all the sources that we ha are left with, uh, the structure of Orion is already starting to become quite apparent. However, there is still uh, not in considerable degree of contamination from the field stars. Uh, plus, there's just so much data and in so many dimensions that it's starting to uh, become quite overwhelming trying to make sense of it all. Just how is everything associated with each other? Uh, just looking at it in a two-dimensional projection can be di quite difficult to distinguish. Uh, so in order to better make sense of it all, uh, we've ran all this data through a hierarchical clustering algorithm. And how hierarchical clustering works is first you uh, measure distance from all the, uh, all, the all the sources to all the other sources, and then you find the shortest distance and the second shortest and the third shortest and so on and so forth until all the sources in your catalog are connected uh, with a minimum spanning tree like you see over here. 
Then what you need to do afterwards is to figure out a place where you should cut all the branches. So you end up with the groups that are neither too small nor too large in order to be able to trace the dominant structure uh, in your data. And it is possible not to, to do it not just in two dimensions like you see here in this image, but also in as many as you want. So in our case, six dimensions, three dimensions of position and three dimensions of motions. And by tinkering with exactly how you define the linking length, you can also include the sources which have missing data that is, they have been observed either with Apogee or with Gaia, but not with both. And using this technique, we were able to deconvolve the Orion complex into 200-ish clumps. Uh, so this panel shows the characteristic size of each clump that we deconvolve, and this panel shows their characteristic velocities. Uh, and they are color-coded based on the larger structure that they inhabit. Uh, so green is Orion A, yellow is uh, Orion B, blue is Lambda Ori, Cyan is a group that uh, contains Sigma Ori, even so it has relatively little molecular gas remaining. Uh, we extend the naming convention for the molecular cloud and refer to it as Orion C. And the C, uh, red structure is we refer to as Orion D, which is located in the foreground to everything else. It traces quite closely the distribution of the built stars, other notably bright OB stars in the regions, and stretches as far down south as Rydral. Uh, and it's quite interesting that it is, uh, overlaps so closely in the plane of sky with Orion C, but uh, it is very different in radio velocities and in distance. Uh, but in terms of the ages, uh, they are rather similar as well, which is why we, they haven't been distinguished up, to, up till now. And we also recover this uh, small group uh, east of Orion A, which is much older than anything else, with an age of over 10 million years. Um, and the spatial is continuous from everything else, including Orion D, but it's not all that massive, though. In terms of proper motions, I don't have much time to go into them, but in Orion A, we, in L1641 filament specifically, we don't recover many sources that are associated with molecular gas. Rather, we get uh, sources that are located slightly north of the filament, and they're moving perpendicular to it towards the molecular gas. In uh, Orion C, there's very, a lot of curious fluid dynamics happening, with sigma ori moving away from everything else. There is uh, a hint of a possible bubble over here. And probably the most interesting one is Lambda Ori. Uh, and in Lambda Ori, there was a supernova a few million years ago, uh, which expunged all the gas from the center, collecting it in a shell, as you see over here in the WISE data. And the stars that are located in the center of the cluster, they are much older uh, than the stars that are closely uh, associated with the gas shell. Uh, looking at their overall proper motions, uh, all the stars are moving uh, pretty much radially. This plot shows the offset uh, in position angle from the purely radial direction. Within approximately one and a half degree, motions are mostly virialized, but as you move outwards, uh, the motions really are starting to become quite radial, and they are get, getting faster the further away you get. So the motion is pretty much ballistic, which suggests that these stars have formed as a result of the supernova explosion with a ch uh, chase back age for the expansion of 4.8 million years. Now, I've been told that models do not see uh, these sort of signatures when they try to simulate supernovae and trigger star formation, uh, but this, this is something that would be worth looking into in the future. Um, additionally, since Lambda Ori has such a great degree of uh, spherical symmetry, we can look at the circular component of the velocity in addition to the radial component. Uh, so it looks like as we move further out to from the cluster center, uh, the rotation uh, changes from predominantly counterclockwise to predominantly clockwise. Probably something also to do with the explosion of the supernova. And also we can estimate the total mass of the cluster using these circular velocities. Uh, the red line is the best fitted estimate of the virial mass. And we can also estimate the mass by simple accounting of adding up all the mass that we have in the stars that we can associate with lambda ori, which is what this blue line shows. 
So the difference between this red line and these blue, this blue line is approximately a factor of four. So we, from this we can probably estimate that either we are missing a lot of mass in the stars or uh, the mass in the gas and dust uh, that is left over in lambda or in, in ionized space is approximately a factor of three that of the mass of the stars. Uh, so this is just an example of what is possible to do with this data set, and of course, there's much more science that would be possible to do. And I just wanted to highlight a few uh, other people from our collaboration uh, who are here in this talk, uh, in, in, this, in this conference, in particular Kevin Covey. Uh, he will have a talk on Thursday, um, focusing a lot on the Apogee data, and also Hinar Suarez and Serena Kim, uh, they, they have a poster, so please do check them out. Uh, so, just to summarize, uh, Apogee and Gaia are incredible data sets uh, that are unprecedented in the precision uh, and the volume of stars with precisely measured kinematics. And as much as we've already learned from Orion in terms of star formation, uh, we still have so much yet more to learn about large scale dynamics. Thank you. Uh, we can we begin with questions? Uh. So I, I, I'm sort of overwhelmed, Scott Wolk, CFA. I'm sort of overwhelmed by the length of Orion um, at 150 parsecs long relative to something like 30 along the line of sight or along the sky. So. Have you guys tried to figure out what that means about the formation mechanism? Um, not yet. Uh, we are in communications with few modelers uh, who are very interested in testing their models of formation, but uh, they are slightly less interested in trying to simulate the data itself. So it's, uh, it, if someone in this group is interested, please talk to me. Please. All right, Megan Ryder from the University of Michigan. Very nice talk, thank you. I was wondering, do you have any information on the kinematics of the residual gas associated with Lambda Ori? Um, so in terms of uh, where stars are that are so closely associated with the gas, they are similar to each other within one sigma or so. Um, there are some curious uh, radial velocity structures. When you get closer to the center, for example, we do get two different radial velocity components near the cluster center, which I don't know how uh, they probably could have formed. But uh, in terms of the stars that are still associated with molecular gas, they are similar enough. Hi, Kimberly Sokol, University of Texas in Austin. Um, so with this wonderful data, you were able to physically separate these substructures. And you also have all this other data. Um, you showed us the ages are similar, but have you been able to um, differentiate the substructures by any other means, the abundances or anything um, else? Right now, uh, the redu reduction of data that we have it just assumes solar abundances for everything else, but we are currently working on trying to better reduce the spectra that will take uh, abundances into the account. So it's something to look forward to in the future. Any other question? So Apogee was useful for the radial velocity component, yes, not yes. for the metallicity uh, or for other elements uh, yet. No, yet. not yet. With the, uh, we are doing slightly different reduction for the uh, yeah, data sure. because than the main Apogee one because Apogee is primarily focusing on red giants and young giants, stars have a slightly yes. different templates. So we, it, 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 it will be coming, but not yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Hi, I'm Paula Jofre from Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. Um, I wonder when you make this clustering algorithm, you have different components that have different scales, so you must do a normalization. Mm -hmm. and if it changed the clustering you would get when you play with these distance metrics. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, in this case, all the, um, all the position components and all the velocity components were first uh, scaled down by the standard deviation, uh, which is a statistically valid approach to handle the things. So you're just looking at the 
uh, predominant scales of things. Uh, by changing the scale, the results do change slightly, but you still recover the overall structure. Perhaps the exact membership might be slightly different, but the results should still hold. Okay, one, uh, one last question. J JPL, um, <laughs> I was just wondering, um, it, I really enjoyed the last two talks on the OVO okay. associations, it's a great talk. What are the prospects for constructing um, cluster mass functions you know, for the last 20 years, there's been sort of a cottage industry looking at these near-infrared surveys. We look towards these, these dusty clouds, and we count up the YSOs, and now we're sort of connecting it to the OB associations. But um, given the Gaia data, given your survey data, can you actually go into these clumps and create little IMFs for each of these and sort of compare those to what we see in existing star-forming regions? We haven't done it yet, that yet but uh, yeah, it would be possible to do. Some of them are not that big. Uh, the minimum cluster size is around 10 stars, so not enough to sample things fully. But yeah, it would be worth looking into it. That's, that's, that's a good idea, thanks. Okay, thanks again. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next 